I'm Kim Bannerman. I'm from Google, um, and I'm moderating a panel here today. And I wanted to let you all know that this kind of got formed from a talk that I started doing and kind of formed at the last minute, literally on the show floor in Basel, of uh, people first, tech second. And it's kind of how I've been going about my career in tech for the last 13, 14 years. Um, because I feel like before you can, you have to diagnose and understand what are, you know your your folks that are inside of either your customers team or inside your own team and and help them continuously grow and so with that I think you know we get all the conscious bias unconscious bias and things like that but ethics is a huge topic lately um, and it's something that was very near and dear to my heart um, after working with my last cloud company um, and a lot of the current news that that's happened obviously of late it's very timely I also want to say that we are all here on our own. Uh, personal opinions and what we feel as human beings, and we are not speaking for our employers. And with that, I will let everyone else introduce themselves. My name is Daniel Jones. I'm the CTO of Engineer Better. We're a cloud foundry consultancy uh, based out of London. Um, that's probably all you need to know. <laughs> I'm Barb Darrow. I'm a senior communications director at Oracle. I am new to Oracle. I've been a reporter my whole career. Other than that, at GigaOM, Fortune, InfoWorld, the whole nine yards. My name is Marisa Dale. I'm a product design manager at Pivotal Labs, and I recently wrote a Hippocratic Oath after doing a lot of government work for the last two years. And that's, that's the a good great thing piece. about this community is um, we all get connected somehow, right? Someone says, hey, I want you and Marisa to meet because you, you could have some interesting things to talk about, and then it just blew up from there. So that's how we ended up where we are today. Yeah. So talk to us about... Um, the background and what inspired you to write the Hippocratic Oath for Technologists? Yeah, sure. So for the last two years, I've been working on a lot of uh, government projects that have had some big consequential outcomes for, for people um, in the world and um, life and death sort of outcomes, right? Like there's been um, immigrants uh, applying for uh, citizenship to, into the U.S., and we create an app that ingests these applicants and tracks their, uh, their process in a timeline sort of way. And if our app doesn't know where it is in the timeline or the physical location of these files um, at all times, there's a, a very high risk of them being lost or delayed in their application process. Um, another where asylum seekers are trying to get into the US and get asylum status. Uh, and again, if, if they can't apply and if their dependents, their children or their family can't get in with them and those um, riders aren't um, attached to the files properly in our system, again, you know, there's some really uh, very consequential outcomes for, for those people. Um, we also built an app that ingested uh, flight data from aeronautical data from all around the world, and which ends up, you know, long story short, getting put into the, the cockpits of military airplanes and, and helicopters. And if we don't ingest that data correctly and we don't display it accurately for the analysts, uh, there is a very real consequence of pilots crashing uh, or analysts going in having to testify in front of Congress. So um, the weight of all of that um, Plus, seeing my own small child you know, develop a relationship with technology and understanding the dark patterns of the, the hook cycles that m lead him back in continuously. He's very vulnerable to those things. Um, and, and watching his relationship uh, with technology, um, plus, you know, the news <laughs> and uh, probably one too many episodes of, of Black Mirror, um, <laughs> um, just led me to want to write for myself originally a Hippocratic Oath for Technologists. And um, if, you, if you haven't read it, I think of it in terms of maybe three different pillars. I think of, of outcomes, you know, what are the outcomes of the thing that I'm building, both from a, a macro standpoint, um, from a global scale, what is you know, the larger outcome of you know, maybe the, the business model that's at play here, um, but then also the micro, like what are the, the outcomes of the features, the individual features that I'm putting into this. Um, there's also agency and, and the power of the individual who's involved. This is not, oh, it's not my problem. We're not part of a larger machine. Each one of us has a very specific um, role in building these applications, all of us together, whether we're designers, whether we're project managers, product managers, uh, engineers, data tech, um, you know, 
whoever we are, um, we have a, an integral part of, of building that thing. And um, so we're not dissuading ownership or taking agency over this. And then the third part is really um, craft. You know, um, I'm, I'm taking ownership over my um, part of this, and I'm always trying to better myself um, as a technologist, whatever part I am playing in this. And then asking questions and being humble um, to my biases and, and learning um, all the way. So. Barb? I think it's really important um, for what you're doing in software, but also what we do in our everyday lives is that the unintended consequences of things we do, if we're all kind of in our bubbles, and lately it seems like we're more in our bubbles um, <laughs> than ever. And I think diversity plays a big deal in this whole discussion because if you want to know about the unintended consequences of something you're doing, it helps to have a a diverse group working together on that. And there's an exa a local example, actually it's a local example in San Francisco too. There, in Boston, several Boston communities have put a, imposed a tax on plastic bags, you know, in stores. You, if you bring your own bag, you don't pay it. And I was like, this is great, I'm a recycler, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's an African-American man, he said, this is a terrible idea from our perspective. It never even occurred to me. And he said, if you're an African-American man and you're walking out of Best Buy with something in your hand and you do not have it in a bag, there could be unpleasantness. It never occurred to me. So it's not just technology, it's everything we do, mm -hmm. legislation, whatever. Mm -hmm. All right. How about the European perspective? I've got a cough, so I was turning my <laughs> mic on and off so I don't deafen you all coughing. Um, I think we've, well, we've had a fair amount in the news, what with Cambridge Analytica and Brexit and uh, voter manipulation and all those sorts of things. I think it's interesting that, um, uh, the, the technology and the implications of the technology that you were describing earlier, it's about distance. It's about not being able to see cause and effect. And um, uh, Nassim Taleb's uh, new book, Skin in the Game, talks a lot about this. And he defines a bureaucracy as uh, a system where people are divorced from the consequences of their actions. Mm. And the very nature of technology and platforms are that we're going to be distant from the people that we impact. We can't see those, uh, those reactions. They're not the human factor. So for the example of immigration, in the UK, um, the immigration system is incredibly manual. Um, I happen to know someone that worked in the Home Office, uh, which has got its own current scandal about destroying documents and deporting people that have every right to be in the country. Um, but uh, it's very manual. So at least there are people in the border force sat there who are dealing with human beings and can see them. Now, they can switch that off and be sociopaths. You know, I'm sure some of them probably do. And maybe you have to uh, if it's a difficult job. But at least there are humans in involved. And there is some sort of, like, there is a person crying. There is a small child who is being separated from their, from their parents. So there's a feedback mechanism. But as we get more and more distant, I think um, uh, keeping perspective of the fact that we're dealing with humans becomes more and more important because that feedback mechanism doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. There is no natural kind of uh, humanistic way to go, oh, I'm doing a really bad thing, or oh, this is having an impact on people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's a really important point. And it's not just our assumption of what those outcomes are, it's actual outcomes, right? Not the ones that we had you know, strived for originally, but we're checking it continuously and making sure that the outcomes that we wanted are is what's actually how it's being used and, and what they truly are, right? Um, and I think that has a, a really big um, part in diversity too. Like as, as our teams are diverse and we bring diverse um, groups into um, building these things, the outcomes are more true to what we're going for, right? Um, there's a, a really interesting story of uh, the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan um, where there was latrines, uh, they, were, they brought in uh, toilets for this huge refugee camp. It's technically the fourth largest city in Jordan now. Um, but there's latrines that were brought in and designed by people outside of, who, with no knowledge of, of the refugees and, and the, um, the, the way that things were going on there. And essentially there was lights in these uh, refugee, in the, in the latrines. And so at night people would congregate typically men, 
And that meant for women, they didn't feel safe going to the latrines and they would openly defecate, which obviously like spreads disease, right? And so that's a real, very real outcome for something that was, um, you know, had the best intention, you know, it was probably built by people who didn't, who just assumed that lights, they needed lights in the, in the toilets and they didn't understand the real uh, implication of the thing that they put in there. Um, and so that needed to be rethought and re rebuilt, right? And I can draw parallels from the way that we used to develop software years ago and the waterfall or whatever you want to call it approach where we build it and this thing we go off and we're gone for six months, a year, two years to build something. And in the process, there's no feedback loop. There's no active you know, talking to users necessarily. The business analyst at the time was often ignored as they're gathering requirements. Let's be honest. I started out as a BA. <laughs> um, so... And now we've gotten to this consensus-driven type of world. And I know I live in a bubble working for Google. We are very consensus-driven. We are not hierarchical from the top down. I rarely talk to folks that are my managers um, only because, you know, we talk all the time because it's a consistent feedback loop. But I'm mostly talking to folks outside of our team. So I feel like when we're talking about unconscious bias and bias and we're talking about the ethics and technology, um, are you talking to people that don't look like you mm -hmm. in your personal life? Are you collaborating on a project or a program inside of your company or for your customer with people that do not look like you. I think that's number one for me. Um, look around the room, right? Um, and with that, um, I think there's a lot of good points in here. Um, I also want to say this is up on GitHub and we'll tweet it out later so that you can do a pull request, you can add to it. It's very collaborative, it's amazing. Um, <coughs> I will prevent the exploitation of users whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to extra, extrication. Yes. yes. <laughs> so do you want to talk about that one for a second? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's essentially like the Titanic, right? We're, we're on the Titanic, and instead of trying to patch you know, holes in a leaky boat, let's prevent ourselves from striking an iceberg in the first place. Yeah. It's like uh, preventing, it's like, you know, solving for what is the disease instead of the symptoms, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And I yeah. think that's where we start. I think you start so high level when we're talking about these things, but you really have to get to the core of where it goes. Yeah. I, I wonder whether um, in our part of the, not our part of the ecosystem, Cloud Foundry in particular, but the Silicon Valley startup mentality, move fast, break things, mm -hmm. whether we're actually more susceptible um, to doing the wrong thing because of a certain kind of... Um, mission-driven mentality, you know, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you've got a tech startup, you're going to change the world, this is our mission, we're not here to make money, we're here to change things, we're, Facebook famously, we're here to connect people, and that memo that got leaked um, mm -hmm. recently about as long as we're connecting people, what we're doing is okay. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many people get swept up in that kind of groupthink mentality um, that maybe wasn't so much uh, a thing 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Maybe in old waterfall uh, development where people were like, we're writing business software to make money. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe uh, folks were less susceptible to that particular type of uh, being subverted and swept into doing things without questioning what they were doing. Yeah, I mean, I certainly did. You know, move fast and break things. Cool, that sounds like fun. And then you fast forward 20 years and you're like, well, what is things? It's people. It, <laughs> Political it's processes. People. It's democracy. Mm -hmm. It's security. You know, mm -hmm. like, we didn't question. I didn't question, and now here we are. That's why I appreciated the T-shirt on day one of keynotes, where it's move, press, move fast and don't break things. Right. I think that's why it resonated so much with Abby and all of us. You know, in the audience who yeah. have gone at this breakneck speed for such a long time, um, breaking things, failing is okay, um, as long as you're learning something from yeah. it. Right. Yeah, right. Um, I think I, I see us as being, you know, in the technology industry at this sort of inflection point right now where, you know, previously we were always, you know, can we build it? Can we, are we able to do that? Yeah, it's a big challenge. Like, let's just try and get it out there. The ability to be able to do that and build whatever we want is there now. And I think that we need to start shifting into should we? Should we build this? Absolutely. That's why it's people first, tech second. Yeah. You can build it doesn't mean you should, right? right. Just because How you many can. custom applications have we all built in our time in tech or have seen or had to use that are, wow. <laughs> can I ask, I would love to ask you guys, because I'm not part of the Silicon Valley um, ecosystem, really. Well, I guess I am now, but anyway. Given that venture capitalists, I, I can't remember, they, what was the manifesto that Reed Hoffman did? It was, um, it was about 
uh, di hiring diverse people, and, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you guys have seen any change since that. It's been it's been about six or eight months, mm -hmm. and also in the hiring practice, do you see anything that's the equivalent of the Rooney Rule in football, which was a which was a mandate that if a team was hiring a head coach, they had to interview someone non-white for the job. I'm just wondering if you've seen anything like that, or if you've seen any impact from the read. So I think thing. with the VC pledge of diversity was mostly just to put it in writing and make people have it in their mind and be mindful of it. Has it changed? I'm not sure. Um, I just moved to San Francisco a month ago. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't think in the UK there is anything like that. I think it was suggested for the football association, like soccer, and uh, there was uh, uh, an outcry about it because people start conflating. We, we have very strong legislation about equal opportunity, um, and I think there uh, was a conflation of issues of if you make sure that you have at least one candidate who's from an underrepresented background, are you then not taking someone, right. like, is that additional to the people you would have interviewed anyway? Yeah. Um, or are you then pushing someone else out? Um, and I think that's probably an area where uh, folks get, uh, where a lot of uh, controversy uh, arises. But no, the, this I'm not aware of uh, anything. And I think it's something that people are fairly sensitive about talking about as well, because of that reason of like, ah, are we going to get sued if we do this wrong? With um, We find it fantastically difficult to find uh, resumes of people from underrepresented groups. We work with traditional recruiters. Engineer Better is a small company. Um, there's only 12 of us at the moment. And um, whenever we talk to recruiters, um, we, we always make a point saying we're happy, you know, we welcome people from underrepresented groups. Um, and the number of resumes we get through from, um, from women in particular, I can think of two maybe that we've received um, out of uh, say 50. So it's a very small percentage. We have one recruiter in particular who sends a male shot every time they have a female engineer there's a woman, there's a woman with technical skills, see her now. Um, and uh, that suggests to me that there's probably uh, something not right. So it's very hard to, to find people and it would be better if there were, if there was clearer guidance. Uh, and if, if there was something like the, the Rooney rule that uh, maybe was mandated uh, by government, um, then it would give people clarity of like, this is an okay thing to do. You're not going to get sued for uh, you know, uh, equal opportunity by doing this. And then it would allow recruiters and, and other folks to, uh, to work with us better, I think. The way that I look at it, and it's something that's very passionate for me, um, I worked in the recruiting industry during the recession. Um, when I was in consulting before that because there was no consulting work, let's be honest. Um, and I think you have to create the environment to make underrepresented groups feel comfortable enough to apply. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is with the small companies or some of the other, you know, they're just not aware, right? Um, and so, you know, it's the work hours, it's a bunch of other different things as well. And a startup founder actually said, will you come consult for, for me because I'm totally missing this right now. And, you know, he's an engineer and has always been an engineer, and he said, you know, admittedly, you know, I'm trying to hire diverse candidates, and I hired this person, and we're doing these, you know, crazy, you know, push schedules, and, you know, it's a startup. They should have assumed that, you know, and I'm kind of wondering why this person's going home at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm like, well, <laughs> A, have you had a conversation with them at all about it? No. Um, did you talk about this in the hiring process? No. Okay, well, okay. There you go. There you go. And he had this big light bulb aha moment. He was like, will you come consult for me? I'm like, nope. <laughs> I like what I do, but I'm... You know, that's what you can do now. Uh, plan ahead, right? Um, I think asking questions as technologists, right? Um, for what we do in developer relations, um, I actually pitched this to Grace Hopper a few years ago with a lot of different DevRel folks from inside big companies as well, like eBay and, and, and inside of, you know, I was at IBM at the time. I think developer relations as a concept and a practice because it's centered around empathy and all these different words we use and we throw around a lot, but I don't think a lot of people really understand how to measure that. Mm -hmm. I think if every company approached a project or a team with that in mind to have a continuous feedback loop, don't build anything in silos, be transparent, we would get a lot further, a lot faster, mm -hmm. um, with a lot less stumbling along the way. And I think everyone can buy into that because it's a growth mindset. You're always learning, and you're around people that aren't necessarily that look like you. And we, and you know, at 
I'm not speaking for Google, but we have you know, our own processes that we're building internally, and that's a big piece of what I do, um, is to create that loop from our end users and customers and things like that. Um, and, and it's huge, and we're starting to do those out on site at our customers now, too, as well, uh, to get the product teams and the engineering teams talking with each other. You know, yeah. Let's just get in a room, get off of Slack. Yep. You know, it goes back to what Hannah was talking about. We're so distracted by so many platforms. I'm like, pick a platform. I'm on all of them. You know, we all are. How many Slacks do you have? Too many. Oh, way too many. I have yeah. six that I'm actively signed into. Yeah. There, I don't even know how many I'm not. Eleven, I think, last time. Right. Night, yes. That's not, yeah. So we can talk about the, you know, the, the fatigue of that as well. Right. Um, and that makes us slower. It makes us, you know, uh, a bottleneck when we're trying to get things out the door because we're too busy with the notifications, right? Um, but we're also not talking to each other face to face. You know, we use a lot of GVC at Google, even if we're not physically in the same space, because we are very distributed, my team especially. Um, and that, that helps because you, you get a sense of that's a real person right there. You know, we may hate video conferences, I get it. You don't want to put makeup on if you're working from home. <laughs> you don't have to. Everyone's there. So. so, what other pieces of the Hippocratic Oath like really spoke to you, Dan? I was. To not answer your question, but to not to, like I, I, I'm just just listening to you speak, it, it's kind of a, a, a thought was going off in my head about feedback loops and and the fact that so many of it, it, of these issues can be solved with feedback. It's the absence of feedback and the maybe I'm just I think I'm probably like slow. It's been a long conference and it was late night last night. But the um, the world there is a diverse range of people. You can get things to market and then find out from that pe those people that you didn't foresee your, your consequences, but having a diverse range in your team, like that gives you the fast feedback because those people are already there uh, and then, so you're more likely to see the, the effects of your actions. And the world is complex and you're not going to be able to see the, you can't, like, so we end up dealing a lot with complexity theory um, and complex adaptive systems and looking at how organizations, you can't say, are we going to change this organization in this way? We'll do this and it'll have that effect because uh, long, complicated reasons, things are fundamentally unpredictable. Um, so if we know that we can't predict the uh, outcomes of our actions, then it's important that we get empirical evidence of, of what those uh, consequences are as soon as possible. And that's, uh, sorry, that's just a kind of light bulb. Ah, this is how all these things connect. Mm -hmm. um, that yeah, we're, 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 we're building such complex systems now and very global systems, right? And our solutions end up being too simple. I think that we can raise the bar and make our solutions more complex and understand that complexity of, you know, the system at, at large, the people within it, you know, like. A, um, and, and all the players involved. Um, because y y when you start talking about edge cases, like Facebook, for example, totes 20 billion users, if you don't count the Russian bots. Um, <laughs> 1% of that is still 20 million people. Those are mm -hmm. real people, living, mm -hmm. breathing people with lives. Mm -hmm. And to think about 1%, which is a typical edge case in any most products, yep. right? Like, there's no edge cases. I think that we can raise the bar in, in saying, like, you know, when you, when you talk about edge cases, you talk about where you're drawing the line and what you care about. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can, we can do better than that. Like, we can involve a more complex system and a more complex understanding of the people and the players involved. I agree. I think your piece is really a great thing to point to if you're in a hiring process. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, as a reporter, I used to think of a lot of these things as, oh, this is PR. But, you know, the thing is you have to have the conversation, and it's nice to be able to point to something. And it would also, I'm curious if you guys as hiring people ever, there's been a lot of talk about rock star programmers and the people who have the best, you know, language skills and this and that and the best DevOps skills. But are there questions in the interview process to weed out like bad actors? You know, like <laughs> Kevin Spacey is a tremendous actor. I don't think we're ever going to see him again because right. nobody wants to work with him. Right. Um, is there a part of the hiring process where you have like a let, let's don't hire asshole rule? I mean, <laughs> we, we call it being googly. There, yeah. You know, and if you're not Googly, you're not going to get through the process. You know, it's just plain and simple. Is that being Googly is not being evil or being a good um, person. And it's also, um, 
you know, helping your fellow coworkers and it's, you know, having integrity, um, having a little bit of irreverence, you know, not being afraid to, to push, you know, push the envelope as they say, or whatever analogy you want to use. Um, you know, it's a, I think at the core of it for me though, I think everyone describes it differently. For me, the, the core of it is kindness. Mm -hmm. um, and I have it on my Facebook banner. It says, be kind, it's gangster, because it is. <laughs> You know, like how anyone can be negative, what a anyone can pick through things. Like it's it's harder to be kind, especially in the face of of something that you're dealing with. It's like really tough if it's personal or for you know professionally. And I will say this: like I genuinely believe that all of my coworkers that I work with in my my cool little utopia of Google mm -hmm. are there for the right reasons. So, with yeah. the oh sorry. Um, with the hiring, um, we've, we've had examples of this, uh, but we, we put our values, our company values and the, the, the values that we founded the company with, the, the common ground between Dan and I, um, on the website. And so when we have uh, interview candidates, it's like, uh, so which of our values resonated with you? Which ones did you feel particularly strongly about? And if people go, uh, uh, well, I did see that page, <laughs> then we know that maybe that, you know, Either they're there just for the technology, which is fine, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it's also a bit of a, a, a smell that maybe we should dig deeper into mm -hmm. the interview process. But when we're hiring, uh, we do a pair programming interview. Yeah. So we, we don't set people up with trick questions. Those are the most effective, questions. I think, personally. Yeah. Yeah, That's what we do, too. Yeah, but you sit down and work with them for an hour, and you get yeah. to find out how they, they respond to being told they're wrong, for example. Yeah. That's well, exactly not right what or wrong. It's more about how does your brain work, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, are you questioning our assumptions? You know, can you push back on us? Mm -hmm. uh, can you take redirecting? You know, we give mm -hmm. you some feedback on something. Mm -hmm. Can you stand there with humility and be like, oh, maybe that wasn't the right idea to throw out. Maybe we should approach this and think about it a little bit differently mm -hmm. and reiterate in the moment. Um, we have exercises that kind of poke at that and then we pair as well. Um, we don't have everything perfect, but um, I really, like, you know, buzzwords aside, we really do look for empathy and humility uh, and yeah. that, um, you know, that questioning nature in people. And, and I think we, we are doing those things right. I mean, I, I've always said I look for those things and I can teach the other things, you know, like the actual skill, in my case, design skills, if they're lacking those things, I'll sit with them and I'll teach them. But I want somebody who's humble and who's empathetic. And curious. And curious, and ask lots of whys. You know, why are we doing that? Can I Any honestly, final thoughts? We're at time, so. Oh, blimey. Go to happen quickly. We're five minutes over time, actually. I, um, I, was, I found an answer for your question. Yes. The bit of the Hippocratic Oath uh, that you wrote that I think was most important was the word respect. And yes. actually, um, the, it, it's respect for users, it's respect for the humans at the end of things. It's something that actually there's, there's precedent for in the industry with a socio-technical approach, like before RAD was a thing, before XP was a thing. Um, respecting users, respecting their time, respecting the impacts for them. And it's, so you've got this user-centeredness um, that it's easier to be respectful and you know, consider the implications of your actions when you've got a, a user interface or you know that humans are going to be doing something. If you're a machine learning person in the middle of Facebook, you're working on cogs inside this machine. And at that point, I think it's important for people to, to be prompted by things like the Hippocratic Oath to take a step back and go, do I want to make cogs for you know, military aircraft? Do I want to, we've turned down work because um, it had defense applications because we weren't comfortable with that. Yeah. So, if people can zoom out a little bit and be prompted to zoom out by, by these kind of discussions and go, is this something I'm happy doing without kind of getting in a rabbit hole of like, oh, I just like doing machine learning stuff. I'm going to forget what the application of this is. Yeah, and I think that that is one of the ultimate goals of why I wrote that. I mean, I've said no to projects too that I wasn't comfortable with and I'm trying to work on frameworks for the rest of my team right now to help them think about what it is that we're actually building, not just their part of it, you know, like, mm -hmm. oh, this, uh, this integration is going to be really cool. Yeah, but what is the ultimate outcome of right. the thing that you're integrating right, right. now? Um, get people to internalize us a little bit more. And it's really a gray area. It's never black and white, right? It's ethics. So we need to take the individual on this upon ourselves to make mm -hmm. those decisions. Well, great. Thank you for writing it. And uh, I think we could probably talk all day about it. So. <laughs> How many views have um, you had? Oh, we'll tweet it out. Um, the Hippocratic Oath Millions, is up on GitHub. Millions. She has a great blog post about it. Um, thank you all for coming. And what's next is a diversity lunch. And I invite you all to uh, go take a look at the Chasing Grace project. It's pretty cool. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers.